This episode of Dorking Out is brought to you by Shock, because, because, oh my god! Oh. My. God. Houston, flight is go. Myla, all let's go. SPM. From Assignment X, Amalgamated Storytelling, and the SoniaShow.com, it's Dorking Out with Sonia Mansfield and Christopher Allen Smith. Welcome to episode 65, 65, 65 of, of Dorking Out. I don't know why we're reacting to 65. It's not like 50 or 75 or 100. 65! 65! A podcast for people who like to dork out about stories and the stories and culture that we love. That means movies and TV, mainly TV today, books and podcasts, and everywhere and everything else where we find stories that interest us. This is the... Are Star Trek, the Emmys, and Hollywood Studios still a thing edition? With me today is my co-host, professional writer and author of the Sonya Show blog. That's a blog about the Emmy Awards. <laughs> Actually, that that's the most accurate one I've, I've given the, so far, now that I it's think like, about it. I'm, well, sometimes it is. That's right. So, uh, Sonya Mansfield. With me today is my co-host, Emmy Award-winning filmmaker and professional liar and nerd author, Christopher Allen Smith. The and lying leads to the nerd author. <laughs> <laughs> In this week's episode, our Star Trek experts, experts, <laughs> I can talk, Jeff Bond and Alexandra August join us to talk about what Star Trek means to us as a lead up to Star Trek Discovery, which premieres on Sunday night. Aren't you so excited, Smith? I am very excited. I am also very excited. We are going to be doing weekly recaps and discussions after each episode, so consider this kind of your warm-up. In our second segment, Todd Bishop, co-founder of GeekWire and our old boss at the Orion, the weekly newspaper at Chico State, joins us to talk about kind of the Silicon valley in of Hollywood, how Silicon Valley is impacting storytelling, and he's going to tell us about how we've wasted our lives. That's and right. finally, <laughs> the award winning Chico State journalism program. I got to point that out because when you say you went to Chico State, people cast you a lot of looks. This is one of they the best. Do. This is one of the best journalism programs in the country, and you can see what I've done with my degree. <laughs> And finally, we end our show with a quick recap of Sunday night's Emmy Awards. What were our favorite moments, our least favorite moments, and why is it that the one show that's supposed to celebrate the best TV has to offer is the most boring thing on TV? We've got a lot to talk about, so let's get this podcast started. Hey, want more Dorking Out? Yep. You can visit our website at dorkingoutshow.com. You can. And you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. On Twitter. Do you listen to us on iTunes? Yep. It's cool. It's cool. We won't tell anyone. Nope. Please take a few minutes out of your busy day of pretending to work while you watch cat videos to give us a review on iTunes. Cat videos! For some reason, iTunes really cares about reviews and it helps us attract more listeners and you want us to have more listeners and be popular and cool, don't you? Yep. Of course you do. Yeah. And now, on with the show. Yeah. Topic one, the meaning of Star Trek and a little preview of our Star Trek discovery with Jeff Bond and possibly Alexandra August. We'll see. Keep an eye on Skype. Anyway, Star Trek, to put it simply, is the bedrock of science fiction for millions around the world. Many of us were first introduced to the joys of fantastical storytelling by Gene Roddenberry's unkillable show decades ago. And ever since, nearly every aspect of genre storytelling has been influenced by that show or the dozens of of other shows and movies that have followed. So to preview our weekly discussions of Star Trek Discovery, which starts next week, we thought that we would talk Star Trek in general. What does it mean in an era of Marvel and Game of Thrones and Star Wars revived? Is Star Trek still as relevant as we think it is? I think it is. Um, Joining us today, possibly, uh, is to talk about this will be first up jeff bond uh my Hello? favorite hey jeff my favorite living pop culture critic he wrote the book on star trek music has helped release 
the amazing Star Trek, the original series complete soundtrack box set. He even played Dr. Leonard H. Bones McCoy on the late great Star Trek New Voyages. And in December, his new book, The Art of Star Trek, The Kelvin Timeline, will be released. And I am sure I will be reading it by noon on Christmas Day. <laughs> also joining us, maybe... <laughs> is Alexandra August one of the quickest, funniest, maybe a sleepest pop culture commentators? Yes, <laughs> we know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she has a fantastic Game of Thrones podcast uh, called Got Thrones. Uh, and from her writing in Geek Magazine, which is fantastic. Uh, so if you don't know who she is, that's your lost dummy. I'm sure she will probably be getting on later in the segment and if she doesn't she will not hear the end of it so jeff <laughs> thank you for joining us um first up the very easy question what does star trek mean to you is star trek still a thing uh well you know i i guess for me you know it, it was my favorite thing ever probably starting at age like 10 or 11 uh, I won't date myself by saying when I started watching it, uh, <laughs> but it was a long, long time ago. And I, I did, uh, you know, grow up on the original show. And that to me is the, kind of the template of what Star Trek is. But I, I think that it's funny because uh, in in kind of being swamped by like what Star Trek is to all my Facebook friends and people on social media. I do think I, I, there is a big divide between how certain people look at it and how maybe I and some other people look at it. Um, I think I have always looked at it as entertainment. And, uh, you know, I, I think within a few years of watching it, I read uh, Stephen Whitfield's book, The Making of Star Trek, um, which was you know one of the first books to kind of show me behind the scenes of how a television show gets made. Um, so I always looked at Star Trek it's a lot, so much of it in terms of like production value, and just you know I, I picked apart the elements of how it was made you know that how it, the acting was was approached how it was written uh how stories evolved how how special effects were done back in the day and how things were designed and why they had to look the way they they wound up looking and that to me was fascinating there's a whole other element of star trek which i think is very entertaining and fun which is to look at it as sort of something real uh, but <laughs> in a weird way, that ha has gone. Ha people have taken that so far that it, I, it's become almost like a religion, and I, it's reflective of, of uh, you know society now. It's you might as well be talking about you know uh, liberal versus conservative or Trump voters versus non-Trump voters. Uh, you get I, I see like almost violent disagreements from people about you know yelling at each other about what star trek is right, right now and uh i find that very depressing um that you know people are ba basically shutting each other out uh because they have such a concrete uh invaluable idea of what star trek has to be that they can't allow it to be anything else uh, and they're not even willing to wait to find out what Discovery is going to be. Uh, I, I was just reading, uh, you know, post by a guy telling everyone to don't post anything about Star Trek on my feed, Star Trek Discovery on my feed. I will not be watching the show. I do not, you know, wish to have any discussions about it. Um, you know, the, n nothing about Star Trek. It's, I'm blocking that out of my life going forward. Um, and I, I guess it's fine. You know, if people don't want to watch it, that's fine. But to make it this kind of, you know, religious stance, I, I think is kind of weird. Well, yeah, I, I actually I feel sorry for that guy. 
Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I do find it sad too. And I, believe me, uh, I m- may wind up hating this show. I've, I've certainly hated uh, some previous Star Trek shows. I watched all of them because I was, I wanted to see how things w- were done. And the, it, with some of the shows, I hated them while watching them. I, I think I hated really Voyager. Drove me crazy. Uh, I I watched it every week. It was actually the one Star Trek show I could watch with my wife because we both sort of saw it as like this kind of uh, gentle sitcom, which <laughs> is how a lot of the episodes actually played. Right. Uh, but then, uh, but I found it incredibly frustrating because to me, it just it every episode just sort of spat in the face of the whole concept of the show. Uh, it was constantly fighting its own concept uh and so i found that really frustrating to watch week after week but then now i go back and i had to look at it again when i was working on a record project and i was thinking uh you know this is pretty good these characters are are very defined and you know a lot of the actors are good the story there's some good conflict which is something i i found you know is often very lacking uh in in those shows so you know it's i wonder if people will refuse to watch discovery and then you know go back and look at it seven years from now or something and and find out it was good or vice versa who knows well isn't that the way it is with a lot of star trek Uh, you know the people watch it watch it they have these initial very hot reactions and it, maybe it's just the Reddits and subreddits that I go to. There's always the "Hey guys, I really liked Voyager" kind of thing, mm-hmm. or "Hey guys, I really I, I don't think Enterprise is so bad." And it's this yeah. constant. And and what's funny is those postings pop up every three days. So it's like yeah. it, it, apparently a lot of people do really like this stuff. And I I, I agree with you with Voyager is that it seemed like a strange show in that it had such an interesting potentially dramatic concept that it almost did nothing you know with as the show went on and it just seemed like a seven years of missed opportunities um i i almost wonder if that's kind of what star trek became in the later incarnations because i thought i thought the idea for enterprise with it being a prequel, but with this time travel element put into it, could have been actually very interesting with the whole, you know, theoretically everything we know about Star Trek is in jeopardy from week to week because it can all be wiped out. But then they didn't really seem to do a whole lot with that either. Um, yeah, I found, I think I found it enterprise the most frustrating uh of of all the shows and it, it was mostly because uh of the characters uh and the and the cast although some of them were there were some who were quite talented there was some you know who were, who were terrific people i assume they were all terrific people uh but they just out of the gate didn't have you know they didn't g- grab me as interesting people to watch as characters and uh they the shows the stories i think that there was a kind of creative exhaustion that had crept in by that point too where this the stories weren't really very there wasn't a lot of drama in the opening seasons and then they had this this left turn where they were kind of like well okay now we're going to do 9-11 um, right. cause it, it, the show came, you know, the show was devel- in development before nine 11. And, and so, uh, sort of started off with a pre nine 11 <laughs> outlook. And then by the time it launched on nine 11 had happened and, uh, it, then they sort of realized, well, wait, I guess we have to adjust to this. And s- there was uh, some potential there, and actually so- a couple of the strongest moments, I think, came out of that. But I, I just never found Scott Bakula compelling as a captain. He seemed like, to me, a very weak uh, character and someone I never felt like I would follow, you know, on, on a mission. Um, and that, you know, really kind of dragged the show down for me. And then it was also seemed to be ignoring kind of intentionally ignoring all the fertile ground for 
you know, a prequel. They, they seem to like, oh, well, we don't really want to address the origins of, of the original series, which is kind of what I wanted to watch the show for. So right. they would lo- kind of tease that here and there, but never really dive into it. And then by year four, they, I think they felt they were really probably almost certainly going to be canceled and thought, well, okay, well, we'll just give it to this guy who wants to do, <laughs> who wants to do a lot of uh, TOS continuity shows. And, and that's what they did the fourth year. And everyone, fans really liked that. But, and I, I thought it was very interesting to watch too. And there's some really neat stuff. But again, it was like with a boot group of characters who I didn't really care to follow into those stories. Right. Uh, if if they would have had a different cast, I think, you know, I probably would, th- you know, that fourth year, that show probably would have been one of my favorite things ever. But instead, I was I was sort of just watch looking at all the set design and ideas and thinking, oh, that's neat. But I just don't actually care about it that much. So, so what would you say is your favorite show? Out of well, all... definitely, de- definitely the original. Uh, and I think everyone has their, you know, it just depends on what era you grow up in. I, I highly doubt that there's anyone who discovers that their favorite Star Trek show is one that was made before they were born. I mean, I, mean, I think that happens once in a while. Right. But most pe- for most people, it's you know the the show they grew up on. It, you know, it speaks to their attitudes and and what society is like at the time uh and you always kind of love i think what you see saw when you know between between maybe when you were 12 and 16 that's when you all the most exciting stuff is happening as i think in terms of pop culture for people and they hang on to that um so yeah, I, I kind of measure everything, and I and I could go. I still go back and watch. You know, it shows on BBC America and in these great high definition prints, and I still go back, and record them, and look at them, and I still marvel at some of the things they did. And and the to me, the thing about the old show that I always thought was the case was, even when it was bad, and it was it was certainly bad at times. It, it was always entertaining. That you know the bad parts of it were entertaining the crazy overacting and and uh bizarre moments uh you know were fun to watch whereas uh, you know even next generation which is probably most people's favorite show uh i uh, that to me if they didn't have a great story a lot of times it was just boring it, yeah. even though they, there were some tremendous actors in that cast uh but particularly the first couple of years, it is almost unwatchable because they just couldn't come up with any good stories. Oh, definitely. I, I've been l- listening to a podcast called um, Star Trek The Next Conversation with a couple of uh, comedian writers. I think they work on the Goldbergs now. But anyway, they're watching every episode, one of which has seen it a million times, one of which has not seen any Next Generation and right. the pl- listening to them plow through the first two years is some of the funniest stuff I've ever, you know, I've heard. Because it's, it is, and I've actually gone back to kind of watch a couple episodes to in anticipation of the episodes that they're going to do. And it's amazing what you used to be able to get away with on TV. It is amazing. You could have a show that is at that level of quality and be successful and have it work. And yeah. You know, and it's amazing how the the whiplash turnaround in quality from some of the season one episodes of of that show to you know by the time we get to seasons three and four, it's it's like not even yeah. the same show. Yeah, it's uh, I, I it's hard to even get back into the mindset of of why I gave that year that show two years, <laughs> <laughs> and it, but it was literally that there was nothing else on, and I, right. I watched you know I used to watch. Project UFO and Buck Rogers and uh, every crappy show that was ever broadcast because at that time that was the only thing on now now and this is going to be interesting for discovery because there's so much out there i can't even like i was taping stuff you know there's like ken burns vietnam war documentary and uh uh 
uh, The Deuce on HBO, yeah. and that, that it's like I'm taping all these shows. It's like when am I going to watch all these things? It's like, and that's not even like the genre stuff, right? So and, and now there's like you know twenty very good genre shows out there that you could be watching. So uh, it's way start, easier it's to a, bail. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's why you know I was, you know you were talking earlier about what Star Trek has to do. What Discovery has to do, and it, it's got to be a show that people have to watch. Uh, if it's not, uh, there's so many other options out there, and, and particularly for them to pay, you know, ten dollars a month to watch it is a big investment for some people. So it's going to have to be so great that you just have to watch it. Well, I want to actually. I wanted to dive into that a little bit because when we had you on a year ago to talk about Star Trek Beyond and Star Trek in general for our Star Trek special, um, you laid out what you thought a new show had to do, and you you said it has to be able to compete with the best stuff on TV. It has to be kind of the most prestige of prestige TV. It's got to go toe-to-toe to Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad or any of that kind of stuff. And And now we've seen some of the visuals. We've seen some of the scenes. We've had some previews. And the show does look from a visual standpoint, as good as anything, any genre show that's on. I've heard a lot of people that don't really watch a lot of genre stuff say that it looks like a, it looks like a movie. Um, you know, it's rated M. It looks like they're going to be treading into some interesting territory. It looks like <laughs> they've almost listened to what you said a year ago and said, all right, here's our checklist, boys. And they've been clicking off every single one. Um, so having said all that, and you're a little bit more inside than most people, how, what are your thoughts in anticipation of it? What do you see for discovery? Well, uh, I have intentionally kind of blocked out, uh, and I've done this with the Star Wars films too. I'm not going after every rumor and digging up, you know, every story, watching every, you know, trailer and, you know, snippet of film although i have watched some of the clips uh uh so th- there's an extent to which i don't want to know bef- you know before i actually watch the first episode in terms of what you know uh, secret background i have uh i ha- i do have a, a mole on the show <laughs> which was sort of an accident that uh this guy it's actually a facebook friend and it's like hey i'm working on the show <laughs> what do you want to know uh and uh then i've got all my other you know trekkie friends who are in the business uh and it's funny because the attitude among them and they've all been watching through the whole you know brian fuller uh problem <laughs> right and uh so they're you know, everything I hear from them is that, oh, it's a mess and it's, you know, the show, show is really in trouble and uh, it's got, you know, it's someone said it's unwatchable. Uh, and they were talking, I think, about maybe the pilot, uh, which would not make it the first unwatchable pilot in Star Trek, <laughs> by the way. If you've seen uh, Encounter at Farpoint. Uh, yeah. It's not going to be. I, I've I, I've said over and over again that if uh, you know, Discovery will have to work very hard in order to be worse than the first season or two of Next Generation. Definitely. Um, and and it is the guy who works on the show is a Star Trek fan and knows the background of all this, and he likes it, and he likes what they're doing. He says that the characters are really compelling in fact i've talked to th- three people i think who, who who've worked on the show all of them thought you know the stories are groundbreaking for star trek the characters are, are really strong um what what i've heard is that the the first two episodes are m- very more jj abrams uh like an approach and and obviously alex kurtzman who worked on the jj abrams star trek movies is a is a producer on this but from what i understand he is not the driving force behind the show 
Um, so I think that there's, I'm certain that there is an influence there. And obviously, you know, the, the J.J. Abrams films, for whatever you think of them, they are the only new, you know, uh, can, uh, canon produced Star Trek done in the last decade. So those do show you what the modern visual approach to Star Trek is as far as that goes. There hasn't been anything else that's you know, been done other than fan films. Uh, so, th- so I think that there's, I'm sure there's going to be a, an element of, of that look, although, you know, another raging argument. There, there are still people who are convinced that it is you know, part of the Kelvin timeline, and there, and it's simply because it doesn't look like it was made in in 1966. Right. Uh, and there are people that some of the people who are refusing to watch the show are refusing to watch it because it doesn't look enough like it belongs in 1966. <laughs> uh, which I, you know, I as a tr- as a big Trekkie, I sort of get that and I, I think it's really fun to you know i obviously was in, in a couple of star trek fan episodes where the whole idea was to recreate as accurately as possible the look of the show in 1966 and i absolutely love that but i don't walk around believing that you could do that in a you know 2017 show i feel like and sell, those- sell it to an audience I, yeah, I feel like those people might complain if they did do that. If yeah. they're, you know, if they did make a show that looked like 1966, then yeah. the same people would be like, well, why don't they update it? Special effects have gotten so amazing since yeah. then. Blah, blah, blah. Well, like, it's, right. it's a real, uh, I mean, there's a kind of a fine line because there are people who, there, basically, there are people who say, well, I know exactly how to do this, which is you, you know, you clean up the effects and you make the, the, space effects look a little bit better but sort of still using the same aesthetic and design approach and uh so you you basically repair all the obvious horrible seams and things that you can pick apart when you watch you know a 1966 episode but you make everything else exactly the same and uh that you know just doesn't work somebody described uh they said like showing you know a a original star trek episode to my kids to them it's like kabuki theater you know (laughs) the the aesthetic is so different and and i think that you know when i go back and look at it i I think there's some episodes you could probably show like balance of balance of terror and and uh, there's a few other episodes where it's pretty sober, uh, a, l- a little bit more low key, and and that's some of my favorite stuff. Uh, you know, that I think the you know the kind of standard line on William Shatner is what you know that he was this ludicrous, you know, hammy actor uh but if you the key to to him and to all hammy actors was that if you got them tired enough that then they were they fantastically underplayed everything uh and uh, that you could see all sorts of stuff going on but they weren't uh you know sh- shouting out to the ceiling and that's what you, particularly in the first season of of star trek shatner was so exhausted from just the he'd never done a you know, weekly TV series before. Right. So you actually get some marvelously subtle stuff from him. Uh, so I think that stuff, still, and that's why he could work on, you know, Boston Legal and, and uh, you know, still be a star in, in his 80s. Um, so I think there's some of it that still can work for a contemporary audience, but, uh, you know, obviously most of it doesn't. So, you have to make a show that's going to play to a modern audience. So, you know, in terms of what we were talking about for Discovery and, and what they're tr- what it seems like they're trying to do, yes, it's serialized. Yes, there's a, a gay couple. Uh, it sounds like they're going to be addressing our political divide uh, that we have in this country now, which I think is a great idea. There's, tr- it sounds like there is tremendous ambition, and I have absolutely no idea though what the quality is going to be. 
Right. And to me, how it hangs together as a dramatic television series is the, the most important thing because the original Star Trek was a great dramatic television series when it when it was great when it, in its best episodes and it was the only show for many years uh that of the star trek franchise that was nominated for best dramatic series it, it was on the cutting edge of television of its time uh and that's not true of most of the other star trek shows uh, right next generation got a best dramatic series emmy at the very end uh sort of to say yes this was you know we love this show finally (laughs) uh but get out of here uh, yeah yeah yeah. you were a thing we get it (laughs) yeah yeah exactly but it was not something where that was being looked at among whatever homicide and whatever the other cutting edge dramas of of the era were and certainly by enterprise you know it, it was and the, by enterprise and, and i think this is the problem the biggest problem with star trek right now is that by the time of enterprise star trek was only serving star trek it was mm-hmm. only serving star trek fans it had very little to say to a, a contemporary broad audience um, and and the problem I think with the fans is that they are now much more concerned with Star Trek continuing to serve Star Trek, and to continue to feed this giant mis- mythology machine of uh, you know what's uh, that, and that's why what everyone is arguing about now. How does the you know Michael Burnham poss- possibly fit in with being you know Spock's <laughs> adopted sister we never heard anything about that in 1960 how come spock didn't mention his adopted sister you know in 1966 because he hadn't seen his dad Uh, in 20 years uh, why uh, yes why are people forgetting uh, this and uh but but literally everything that i've heard on you know online about this show from fans is about what it looks like uh and what how it fits in with like how come the klingons look like you know the klingons didn't look like this before it's it's all about treating star trek as history as real history and you you know you can't do this you can't show you know the uh warp drive ships don't look like this and this is not how they operate right uh so there is no room it, it, you know, on the one hand, that it, it everything has to be reinvented, and there it would be insane of them not to reinvent all this stuff. And and Brian Fuller, who everyone, you know, was, was crying about being booted off the show, he's the one who initiated this whole idea of redesigning the Klingons and the Andorians, and uh, the, he was showing off, you know, pieces of makeup design and teasing that stuff at the very beginning of this. So it's not like you know, somebody took over and said, "Oh, well, let's redesign the Klingons." That 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 it was all part of Fuller's idea. Now they did change some of uh, his other ideas that people would have liked. Like supposedly he was going to have the uniforms, you know, look a lot closer to what the you know Star Trek pilots mm-hmm. uniforms looked like in 1965, and. Uh, that I think you could have done that. I wouldn't have had an issue with doing that. Obviously, they that worked for the feature film, so you, it, right. you could easily do something like that. But uh, the, I, I think that's what's driving me crazy with with fans right now. And and to me, I, I for one thing, I have a kind of a sick uh, enjoyment uh, that I get out of watching p- it's either people who've been working in Star Trek for years being forced to completely rethink their ideas of how to design Star Trek or to bring people in who haven't done it before and see what their crazy ideas, you know, for what Star Trek is. I I love seeing all the bizarre kind of funhouse mirror versions of, of what it used to look like, but that stuff drives, you know, fans crazy. Well, I, I, Well, yeah, I want to jump in here real quick, and I want to ask you about that and use that kind of as a stepping stone to your to your book because I, I kind of have the feeling that the fans, in a sense, you know, a lot of people 
really liked the Kelvin Timeline movies, but there was a significant minority, I would say, a very vocal minority that kind of complained a lot and screamed a lot. And it seems as though, you know, we haven't heard anything about a fourth movie for a while. You know, the third movie came out a year ago. There was all these rumors and discussions about a fourth movie coming pretty quick. And once that came out, even though the fans seemed to kind of embrace it, the quote-unquote fans seemed to embrace it quite a bit, there's been a lot of silence on the Star Trek movie front. And I'm wondering if the fandom has kind of, I don't want to say strangled that in its cradle, but if if it's just if it's not possible to build a huge audience, have aspects of a show that will bring in a huge audience and satisfy this fandom, is it is, is Star Trek's worst enemy its own fandom? Yeah, I uh, yeah I've uh, that's sort of been my my uh, mantra for the past few years, and and I don't like everything about the the abrams movies but certainly the first one showed the direction that you could go in and it showed that there was a big mass audience out there it showed that those uh, original characters were iconic and worked completely as movie characters um but the the, the funny thing is that the 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 last movie is the one that I think fans like the most. And to me, uh, it was watchable. There were some moments I liked about it, but it seemed very much a retread of, of things that we'd seen before. It seemed like a remake of Star Trek Insurrection, which was, the, to me, one of the least successful, but most TV episode-like of, wow. of all the, the Next Generation movies. Um and it has the insurrection has a really neat idea at its at its core, which is a classic Star Trek idea. Um, but both insurrection and uh, uh, Star Trek Beyond, I think, fall into serving Star Trek fans and kind of you know giving them all, all sorts of no, nods and winks about different you know pieces of Star Trek lore and telling a very straight story uh that you've seen before and uh the, what what i liked about the f first two jj abrams movies were that they really took risks and they made you believe that there was a reason why this was a movie and not a a tv episode the whole opening of the first jj abrams movie you know is absolutely brilliant and the and and the the whole sequence of the destruction of Vulcan, I think, is is maybe my favorite sequence of of any Star Trek movie because right. of how it shows the not only this incredible spectacle they were able to come up with, but that to then focus it all down on you know the moment when they beam up uh, off of Vulcan and they don't get Spock's mother off the planet and that that shot of you know Spock reaching out for his mom as as she doesn't uh materialize on the transporter pad i mean that right. is to me one of the greatest dramatic moments uh in star trek but that's also a moment where all of these fans are screaming because oh you can't just you know destroy vulcan uh right. and you know to me it's like yes you can do anything if it's dramatic <laughs> you know uh so it, it, yeah, it's it's a source of of um, frustration, and I think that the, the fans do have kind of a stranglehold uh, on Star Trek. But at the, in in a weird way, it's funny because now you know Star Trek has permeated the culture. Everyone knows what it is and who the characters are. But in you know, a in a strange way, because of the fans' stranglehold on it, it has remained something that's a cult weird interest right um whereas star wars is sort of you know embraced and accepted and loved by everybody uh star trek is still something you probably get weird looks for admitting that you like interesting well two questions i want to i want to do two quick questions then we'll wrap up one you seem like the perfect person to ask this question that, that i've wanted to know since the first rumors of J.J. Abrams' movie is, 
my understanding was that original opening with the Kelvin being destroyed was supposed to be the 1960s version of the Enterprise. That would it would actually you know with the old design looking like it looked in the 60s, but you know for a movie audience, and they were going to destroy that ship and have the rebuilt you know the Enterprise that figures on in the rest of the story um, be kind of the new souped up version. Is there any truth to that? Because I thought that was a brilliant uh, idea where you're literally, ter- you know, we're not doing what you think we're doing. But I, my understanding was the studio said, no, you can't destroy that icon in the first five minutes of the movie. You're going to piss the fans off and we'll never get them back. Well, maybe I'm the wrong person to ask this because I have never heard that rumor. Um, no, I, I do, probably wasn't true. I do, probably wasn't true then. I definitely, uh, you know, there's no doubt that there was all sorts of discussion about um, what the Enterprise was going to look like. And I, I do that. It makes sense in a way, because I know that this whole idea of a alternate timeline was being created and uh there was definitely discussion about whether we're going to show, uh, you know, that the 1966 en- Enterprise. Actually, in Into Darkness, there's the scene in um, the Admiral's office that Peter Weller plays. There, he, right. There's a bunch of model starships, uh, and oh, hanging up, up on the ceiling is the original 1966 Enterprise, but you never see it in the movie. It was actually cut out of the movie. Um, so, right. that, and there's a, also a whole, I think that there's a, a huge segment of fandom that believes that, you know, JJ Abrams in t- intention in making that first movie was to literally destroy, you know, Star Trek and destroy the memory of, of 1966 Star Trek and replace it with his own, uh, thing and and actually there's some truth to that in terms of how you know Abrams apparently wanted to uh, not have all the merchandising of the original series out there while the movies were running and he did want uh, you know his uh, version of Star Trek to kind of replace that in terms of merchandising at least while those movies were out there and so the, uh, you know there's there's an extent to which he was doing that but uh yeah i i had never heard that but i i i I, there's also you know uh, the early rumors about um that movie were that it was going to be about uh the uh i forget which ship it is now but there's one of the early ships that kirk served on and there's an episode uh where there's some you know gaseous monster that's killing everybody and it's something that kirk had encountered on um one in one of the ships he was serving on as a right. as a, a young younger officer, and that the sh- movie was going to open with that incident. Right. Um, and uh, but that I don't know how serious that ever was. So before we wrap up, I want to ask you, Jeff, what do you think about the Orville? Well, uh, <laughs> actually, it's interesting because I've been spending the last um, month or so writing a book about the Orville. Um, which is like the third book that I've worked on this year. Um, and so my uh, non-disclosure agreement prevents me probably from talking about a, a lot of it, uh, but eh, to hell with it, I'll talk about it anyway. Yay! Um, the, the, I, uh, I, uh, my take on it, and actually I think the people who worked on it, is that their take on it is that the pilot might have been a little bit rocky i I think it's very difficult to just present that whole concept um to people in a single pilot um and that it probably did it as well as it as it could because you have to introduce all the characters i think by the second episode that was on last night it's actually kind of hitting its stride it's very interesting too to me because the show was really mercilessly uh, ripped apart by most critics um yes but almost every star trek fan that i've seen uh not only was anticipating liking it more than they were anticipating liking discovery but they wound up 
you know, really liking it. So far, it seems to be very positively received by Star Trek fans. Um, and I think that what I'm not sure that an hour uh, is necessarily the best uh, time format for it. But what I think that the show does very successfully is it it throws and this is the idea that if you listen to Seth McFarlane talk about it, the idea was to go back to the kind of bright, optimistic look of uh, you know they, they're not going to say <laughs> the bright, optimistic look of Star Trek because they're right. trying to not talk about that aspect of it. But but basically the brighter look of of sh you know star science fiction of the '70s and '80s or earlier, and how optimistic that was, and to do st standalone allegorical stories. Uh, and that, to me, is the key thing. This is a show that you don't have to know all the mythology of, and that's a huge problem with Star Trek, right. because you, in order to, <laughs> you know, uh, for a new audience, I, I think it's, I that's why I think they keep going back to prequels for Star Trek, because it's like now we got to, you know, everyone doesn't necessarily know all the history and continuity of what are five different series and all how many movies of star trek so we want to go back a little bit at sort of the ground floor of star trek and re-explain what the hell it is to people right um and that what's great about the orville is everyone does understand what a space show with a spaceship and a crew is uh and i would now hope we can, yeah it would, now <laughs> we can just tell you a story and you can pay attention to the story and the characters on this and not worry about how this fits into the continuity of how Klingons looked or who's in Spock's family and who isn't. Uh, it, it's So you can just drop in and watch that show. Um, and that makes it actually different from almost all, you know, television, not necessarily sitcoms, which it's not really a sitcom. Uh, but in terms of dramas, there's, I don't know what show you could look at other than, you know, whether, you know, some Hallmark mystery or something where you don't have to know the whole history of the show to watch it. Most shows now are serialized, heavily, heavily serialized and tell these hugely ambitious novelistic stories. And um, so I think it's probably refreshing to drop in a show where, you don't have to worry about that. Right? Yeah, I feel like the marketing's doing like kind of a disservice to this show, actually, because they're marketing it like it's a wacky Seth MacFarlane comedy. Mm -hmm. And and then we watched the episode and I was like, well, this isn't what it that's not what it is at all. It's I yeah, actually I, I thought I enjoyed the pilot. I, I didn't think it was, you know, perfect, but I could see what it was trying to do and I appreciated it. And was definitely down to watch more. Cool. Yeah, uh, the uh, I think that's been a big problem, uh, you know. And I think they knew this going in is like describing what this show is. That one of the guys I was talking to, uh, you know, described it as being like more like Mash, where you could tell a serious story, but there are people, you know, who are a little bit more human and fallible. Uh, and who w will react to the story with humor. Now, I don't think that's necessarily uh, uh, exactly the right analogy, uh, but it's, it is not a straight drama, obviously, because it does have a lot of comedy in it, but it is also not a sitcom where there's you know a laugh every other minute. Um, and I think also the the humor on the the pilot was uh, a little bit different uh, than what you got in the second episode. The, I think the second episode showed how much more character based the humor can be uh, when it's working, and and I think that ultimately is going to make the show work or not uh, is whether you you like the characters on the show. Cool. All right. Well, Jeff, thank you very much. Uh, we are really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on Star Trek Discovery a week from today. Uh, Alexandra, Alexandra, you're not here, so the teasing <laughs> will now commence. Um, and uh, is there anything else you'd like to say before we see you next week? 
Uh, no, I'm looking forward to the show too, though. Can't wait to see uh, how it goes over. Cool. All right. Me too. Now on to our next topic. This segment is brought to you by The Letter Pro. When you want to write it in Vulcan, you can't spell Spock without Pro. That brings us to Silicon Valley disrupting storytelling with our special guest, Todd Bishop. But first, a, hey, how's it going? Not so quick. Hey. I have a long, rambly introduction, which is Let's hear it. par for the course for this show. Uh, you will let the, don't don't interrupt him, Todd. Yeah, That's t- his thing. Todd's Todd's disgust <laughs> with what I become will become evident when we tell our backstory here in a moment. But first, for our next topic, we're pulling the camera back. To not so much talk about the specifics of a story that we're thinking about this week, but we're looking at the wider entertainment landscape. And what that means more and more these days is looking not to Hollywood, but to Silicon Valley. Now we could talk, you know, start this discussion by talking about the forces of Silicon Valley affecting TV and movies and storytelling and how Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and Apple are pouring billions into filmed entertainment and in doing so, remaking the world once ruled by Universal Studios or Warner Brothers, Paramount, ABC, CBS, Fox, even HBO. But, you know, with a bunch of long, rambly examples of what's changed and what's different. But it all boils down to this. There is a better than even chance that when the next James Bond movie comes out in November of 2019, the opening logo for the studio will not be Warner Brothers, will not be Skydance, some big production company that does big movies, but will be Apple. So to talk to us about Silicon Valley changing and remaking the stories that we love to watch, we're bringing in an old friend from the award-winning journalism program at California State University, Chico. That's not a joke. Don't laugh. It's a very serious. <laughs> Stop laughing, Todd. <laughs> this is it's a serious award winning. It's still winning awards. It's one of the best journalism programs in the country, but nobody can say it with a straight face because it's a Chico state. Anyway, point is, since graduating with Sonia and I. Grad- graduating. <laughs> have I graduated yet? Uh, you, he's going on. Drinking. To, be, to become one hell of a journalist. Sonia and I, not so much. So one out of three, eight, Brad. <laughs> Todd has covered Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, modern technologies in all its forms, and he's co-founded GeekWire.com. I'm sure you've heard of it. Todd, welcome to Dorking Out. It's my pleasure. It's my distinct honor and a privilege. I'm, I feel like I'm giving an Emmy acceptance speech i can i can hear the sarcasm in your voice and frankly i don't really appreciate it bishop (laughs) seriously this is i've been looking forward to this i've been listening to the show of course our history goes way back and yeah it's it's it it really is we're gonna have fun yeah it's great we're we're very happy to have you here um and we're very actually happy to talk to somebody that knows something about this subject because i think sony and i spend a lot of our time kind of watching shows and talking about them and that is kind of the thrust of the show but when i hear some of these numbers being bantied around and i think i think i am kind of i've had my head kind of in the hollywood ether for you know the last 20 years it's something that i'm interested in i even knowing what netflix is doing knowing what amazon is doing knowing the effects that they're having it's hard for me to wrap my head around what the forces that are changing and we're going to get into a couple stories here that I think the biggest changes actually let me start you with this Todd is it would you say it's the biggest changes that Silicon Valley that Amazon's Netflix and Apple's are going to rot on the entertainment industry haven't even really happened yet oh yeah absolutely because I think the biggest changes are going to be a complete change in how we watch So far, they've changed what we watch simply by broadening the horizon. But if you look at what Amazon and Netflix and all these are doing, I mean, they're just using the existing Hollywood system and just sort of putting their own funnel on top of it to put it out into the world. Um, But I think long term, what you're going to see is augmented reality, virtual reality. You're going to see these companies actually change what we watch and how we watch it 
And I think that to me is the reason that the entrance of all these companies, these tech companies into Hollywood and entertainment and media is so interesting is because of that long term stuff. In the meantime, there's some pretty damn good shows. And that's not bad either. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I was trying to wrap my head around because you hear Netflix is, oh, it's spending a billion here, a billion there. It's it's spent six billion dollars on programming, if the, my research is correct. Warner Brothers, one of the oldest, most august, most respected studios in Hollywood history, brought in one point nine billion dollars last year. So Netflix is already pouring you know that's what net what warner brothers brought in so you know they're not putting out that much so netflix is already worth or already pouring as much money into entertainment as two or three warner brothers and then with you know i believe apple just announced that they are putting in a billion dollars over the next i don't know how long um it's it's almost like an, an entire second Hollywood is developing, pouring just gobs of money in. And with one, one of the things that kind of caught my attention with this is, you know, Jeff Bezos is doing a pretty hard turn at Amazon Studios saying that they're not or they don't seem to be going so much more for the tinier dramas or the tinier things. He's saying, I don't want to be doing shows about Zelda or the, you know, a, a show. Like, based what was on, it? Mo- Mozart in the jungle. Yeah. This Mozart in the jungle. I, I, which I believe they're still going with and it's, it's winning awards, but the last tycoon with Tel- Kelsey Grammer, <clears throat> pardon me, based on a story by F Scott Fitzgerald, people were expecting a second season. They're canceling that. And he's saying, I want to pivot. I want a game of Thrones. I want the biggest show in pop culture to be on Amazon. And when you have Netflix already going after that prize, now Amazon's going after it. And then Apple, which has been threatening to get into programming for years, now really, you know, hiring the heads of television programming from Sony. It just seems like the real brawl hasn't even begun yet. In a lot of ways, that's true. Let me say first off, I have, I have a really hard time, no matter how much they spend or who they hire, taking Apple seriously in this space. I mean, if you look at what they've come out with so far in uh, the 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 Planet of the Apps, is that what it is? Whatever, the, the, the show that had the celebrities doing the Shark Tank style thing with the apps. Right. It's, and and they, they're tying it to the iTunes model. It, it feels like they're just, something is out of tune there in some ways. Amazon and Netflix and like Hulu was the big winner tonight at the Emmys with a lot of their shows. And um, it, it's, you know, the, the one that's fascinating to me is Amazon. I mean, they're in, they're in my backyard up here, essentially. Amazon has basically taken over the city up here in Seattle. You know, the median housing price has gone from like 435,000 10 years ago to mid 700s now. And it's, you know, it it's just completely changed the culture and then they're changing the national culture. But if you look at what they're doing in um, original content, it, it it's fascinating because their ultimate goal is not to create great programming. Obviously, Jeff Bezos is going to be happy if they do that, but you know he likes to say they're the only company that's turned Golden Globes and Oscars into sales of toilet paper and diapers. <laughs> I mean, this is what this company he, is doing. I mean, does he really like story? to say that? That's he's like such an odd he said, thing to say. He said that. He said that. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. That is a direct quote. Hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, for, they're the first company uh, to use a Golden Globe to sell toilet paper. Was the quote back at their shareholders meeting a couple three years ago? And so, I mean, this company has different motivations. If you look at that story you sent, Chris, about them right. really wanting a Game of Thrones of their own. I mean, one of the things that their studio head, I think, uh, in there says is that one of the reasons they want to do that is because they want to sell more Prime subscriptions. And so it's a different motivation. And But in the meantime, you know, transparent. I mean, what a fantastic show and an important show to the culture, too. So it's kind of this this odd pairing of commerce and content and culture and entertainment. It's, it's really interesting. Well, I think that's what's interesting is because... Amazon has done a lot of respected stuff. They uh, 
co-funded Lost City of Z. So they're putting out really well-made shows. Actually, now that I think about it, didn't they also have a hand in Moonlight? I could be wrong you know, about sure. that. I, I think you did. I think they did. Yeah, because I think they, well, they haven't. They're yeah. doing the same thing that like HBO did back in the day. HBO started with these kind of smaller niche shows, and then they kind of expanded and expanded and expanded, and they started winning all these awards, and then they get huge. Right. And yeah. I assume that that's kind of what Amazon is doing, too. You start with these little niche shows, like The Tick or whatever, right. and then they – you know, then they get their their Game of Thrones and right. go from there. Yeah, I just... and, and it's the same thing. Like HBO just wanted subscribers, and that's all Amazon wants too. Right, and they want to sell toilet paper and diapers. Right, <laughs> but I, I guess I, I think what I'm kind of marveling at is the scale of the money when they can bring in tech money. I mean, you know, this is one of the things that people who have been watching Apple. I listen to uh, Mac Break Weekly. Um, from time to time, and there's a guy on there named Alex Lindsay, and he's been saying for years that Apple should just outright buy Disney, which I think they could. For, I think the number thrown around to buy Disney is like $50 billion or something, and they have $300 billion just sitting in the bank. Am I right on these numbers, Todd? I'm sure you know much better than I do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Apple Apple's cash balance might actually be more than that. It probably is, but it just if if, if you think about it, the only thing keeping Hollywood from not being bought outright by Netflix, Amazon, and Apple is just they haven't decided to do it yet. It, it seems yeah. like, you know, all these – well, actually, let me step back. You were talking about how you're not impressed with what Apple is doing, and I don't think you're alone. I think, you know, that Planet of the Apps thing did come out. They, make the, they made this big announcement of, oh, we're going to start – Get, to get into uh, original content, and then their first slate of shows is just like it's almost. Are they serious with what they're putting out? Um, well, it didn't work very well because I don't even know what you're talking about, and I'm an Apple person. Exactly. And <laughs> now that I think about it, I've never have these have these shows even come out yet. I know there's been talk about it. People have chatted about it, but I, I you you get them on. Apple Music? Is that right? Is that how you watch these things? Yeah, I think it's right. It's, uh, I, you know, something I've seen it. I've seen previews of them. I'm trying to remember how I watch them. That's part of the issue these days is like there's so many different ways to watch different things. I'm trying to remember how I watched Planet of the Apps, but it was not, right. certainly not the next Game of Thrones. Right. Now, how serious, what is going on with Apple? Because, it, you know, it, it, it is a little baffling when you see the precision of execution from Hulu and Amazon and Netflix and HBO and Showtime. And then you see Apple that has kind of the most money of all and the seems like the most elegance of all or they have this reputation for that kind of thing. Just completely bumbling. What do you think's going on with Apple and why are they bumbling this step so ridiculously I, I think apart from the itunes model and the you know at the time the 99 cent download model and and really popularizing that whole notion of downloadable music i think apart from that apple has really struggled in media in general um, their expertise is hardware and software and phones and computers and and i just haven't seen from them beyond the itunes launch and that, that whole era much in the way of media. And I think this is just the latest example of that. Um, and, you know, I think the cliche would be to point to obviously Steve Jobs is not there anymore. And, you know, he was the one who was able to bridge the technology and design and economics of everything and, you know, make it all work. And I think they've just struggled with that. And, and yeah, I have huge respect for them. I, I, I would, uh, you know, but just in the, the area of media, I think they they just haven't quite figured it out. Now, what, I guess I I want to dig in a little bit more here because I'm I'm just wondering because now that I think about it, if you were to tell me ten years ago, oh yeah, Netflix that makes its money by throwing DVDs into the mail is right. is right. going to be pl going blow for blow up against HBO and you know Amazon what the hell do they know about making shows or <laughs> you know they literally are selling yeah. toilet paper through the mail but they're going <laughs> blow for you know they just you know they're just cleaned up a bunch of Emmys tonight 
what is it about what they're able to do and what Apple that seems like it should be the biggest player because they had a connection with Disney 10 years ago. You know, there's it seems like, you know, with their with with Disney acquiring Pixar. Oh, yeah, I guess it was 10, 10 ish years ago. You would think that Apple would be would have been the first one to this rodeo, but they can't seem to even get out of the gate. Yeah, I, I I honestly don't know in terms of Apple what what the deal is. I I, I can tell you just from watching Amazon. Amazon does get media. Um, you you've seen obviously what they've done been able to do with the Kindle. And when I say they get it, they, they've been able to look at the changes that are happening in the industry and figure out a business model that works for them. And so you know they they still dominate eBooks, and um, that's you know Jeff Bezos's approach. The the principles he's instilled in that company and and they they know how to focus on the customer like a lot of the things that amazon did at the beginning i think people have sort of lost sight of this they did a lot of crowdsourcing where they went out and opened up for like a public pitch hey come in right. give us your script you know it was very and and i think they've you know they like to say they start with the customer and work backward and i know that's kind of a cliche in the business world but i think it can actually work where you're you know, crowdsourcing things and seeing what actually works and then developing those through the content pipeline. I, it, Amazon's a fascinating company. I could talk about them for hours. Well, good, because <laughs> I've got some more questions right now. And one thing that you said earlier that I'm, I'm frankly wondering about is I see the draw of virtual reality. I see the draw of augmented reality for presenting certain kinds of things. But when it comes to the experience of taking in stories, I have to wonder what that's – if the future really is uh, augmented reality or virtual reality. I, I, I almost feel like it's a situation 15 years ago where people were saying, oh, video games are going to be the future of entertainment. You're going to be able to play your characters and walk through the world. Of, of your characters, and it's people are going to start shying away from TV, start shying away from movies. But what happened was, you know, I'd like, I'd like it. I'm, I am suspecting because of the way that you have to experience virtual reality and augmented reality that we're almost looking like a 3D TV situation where there's a lot of hype about it, there's a lot of people talking about it, but once it hits the market, there's still going to be a serious desire when people are at home wanting to be told stories to not have to stick a thing on their face. Um, and I'm wondering if filmed entertainment has a much longer life than a lot of tech people are prognosticating yourself, I think that's definitely, yourself yeah. included. I'm blaming this on you, Todd. Yeah, I know. Way to go, that's, Todd. That's appropriate. It's appropriate. <laughs> um, I, I, I get you. I, I, I understand what you're saying. I think the technology can get in the way, putting that visor on. You know, I, I, I'm a huge fan of even just the basic stuff like Google Cardboard, you know, a simple headset with a smartphone in it. Um, I think watching some forms of video, you doing that are really cool, but you're right. It's a solitary act. Um, I think Facebook's ownership of Oculus is really interesting in that way because they could make virtual reality in particular, a more social experience. And they've already shown a lot of things where, you know, like you at least see stick figures of your friends and the scene around you as you've got this visor on your head. Um, yeah, I, I, I think your 3d TV or, you know, that analogy, I, I think that's, that's a possibility, but I personally have been just blown away by the virtual reality experiences that I've got to try out, whether it's video games or video or, you know, 360 video, so I, I personally am a, a fan of the experience, whether uh, that translates into mass market appeal. I have no idea. I might be an edge case. That's a distinct possibility. Well, let me, <laughs> I don't think I could do it without throwing up. Oh, no. So, OK, so <laughs> that is an outdated. So there when they first introduced these headsets, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I think it's unfortunate that a lot of people tried them. The frame rate was like you know, 30 frames a second, I think. And it, I'd have to get the exact, they have significantly increased the frames per second. And that takes away a lot of that stuff that caused people to barf. 
Because I correct me if I'm wrong, Todd. Isn't it something like once you get up to like 120 frames a second, the perception of individual frames completely leaves your ability to yeah. notice, and then it becomes almost essentially like looking through a window. I'm not sure the exact threshold, but right. it, for me, I, it's totally gone away. Like, I mean, I've tried some weird stuff. There was a South Park video game, like a VR. It was like it was like virtual aroma like I, i've tried lots of weird Ew. stuff yeah it was it was <laughs> awful it was like cartman is do you guys have like a can i talk about it was like cartman farted yeah and then you you got the smell of his fart it was like That's sulfur disgusting. coming up it was oh it was a big stunt at uh, pax the video game convention up here anyway oh well i don't know about that, you that guys i don't That's like nice. throwing up so iem gonna pass on that game <laughs> okay i shouldn't have. That's hey, not a self me Sorry, too that was <laughs> i don't like throwing up either we have so I'm just, much in common. I'm just saying that the, I think that the current experience in terms of VR is much better than I think what people might have experienced three years ago. Well, actually, let me ask you this, because there was a company, uh, a company that actually our friend Anthony Ferrante did some work with that I've also kind of done some behind the scenes work with. They're looking to get into virtual reality and they had him, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, virtual reality. And they had him yeah. shoot a video or shoot a virtual rally, I guess it's almost like a play because it's the, 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 the imager is essentially static. You put the goggles on and then you can kind of look around and watch the story happen around you. And Anthony was telling us, and when, when I was kind of trying to brainstorm some ideas with the producers there, it was the use of the technology was... You didn't really, you weren't really able to move around. You weren't really able to do traditional kind of cuts from shot to shot to shot. You almost had to build it like an environment, almost like a like a stage play. And I'm wondering, and when I when I started thinking about that, and when it came to what I would want, and this could just be me, what I would like to see when I put something on and start looking around, kind of the expectation for what I would find interesting becomes like a different thing. Like I would love to, you know, I'm a historic, you know, I like I like watching history. We're going to be talking about Ken Burns' Vietnam War next week. I would love to stick on virtual reality and kind of watch the bombing of Pearl Harbor in real time, like really see what it looked like, really see what was going on there. But that's not really a storytelling uh experience it's almost like virtual visits or virtual experiences rather than actual stories and my question to you then is you know that's my impression but i think a lot of us are kind of behind the times with your experience because you're seeing the newest the best the most cutting edge version of all this stuff that's coming down the pike at us have you seen kind of story experiences in this that you that hit you in a way like a good movie or a good TV show hits you? Have you experienced anything like that? Yeah, you know, this, the New York Times does some really interesting stuff that is not just um, journalism. They, they've done some things through their arts right. section in VR that I think approaches like a level of storytelling, like there's a levitating one. But you're right, it's not like... Um, it's not even on the level of a TV series or a TV episode at this point. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, it's you're right. I'm, I am struggling to come up with a good example. Um, okay. So, so I think I think there is a lot of lot of room there for people to to create actual storytelling in the VR. And I think the technology is getting in the way there too. To your point about all the setup, you know, one thing that could happen is there's a chance that VR or at least like holographic rooms, um, right. if they can figure out a way to do them without glasses, it may disrupt live theater, live theater before it disrupts, um, recorded that or would be you know, di digital. Yeah. I mean, I think it has, there's a chance for disruption there as well to change the way that we experience live theater, maybe through holograms or, or something like that. Right. Interesting. So looking ahead with kind of, you know, cause uh, in preparation for this segment, everybody, um, I sent an interesting Variety uh, article around to all three of us where it talked about Amazon kind of shifting gears from 
where it's gone with television and trying to kind of get bigger, splashier shows going. Um, what do you see as the fu- that kind of future with, you know, when I, when I see this much money being poured in to Hollywood after all the money we've seen poured in over the last three or four years, I guess since, I guess we, we could say that, that this era of entertainment started with House of Cards where Netflix was playing at the top of the game and then Amazon is playing at the top of the game. What do you see going on here? Is, is the competition just going to get more fierce, more ridiculous, crazier? Or what do you suspect, knowing what you know about Jeff Bezos and Netflix, and where do you see them wanting to take this? Yeah, I, I I think Amazon in particular is going to be investing heavily here. Um, the Hulu is is it's really interesting. I think the Emmy win uh, that we saw here tonight, Sunday night, is notable in that I, I think it's going to make people pay attention to them in terms of their original content. Um, you know, they they what's the name of the series? Is it The Handmaid's Tale? Yeah, The Handmaid's Tale. Tale. Yeah. I mean, they just kept coming back up and up on stage, and you know, like half of them were saying thanks to Hulu. So I think it's essentially a three-horse race there between Hulu, Netflix, Amazon, and to some extent HBO. Although I was thinking about this earlier today, are they technically a streaming service? Whoops. I believe they are now. Yeah, which is interesting because I was I was just looking at this today, is and they're pretty cagey with their streaming service numbers. There, I think they have three million. HBO, the biggest dog in the race 10 years ago, has 3 million streaming customers. That's it. That's all they have. Hmm. So, which, I mean, how many people have have Amazon Prime? It's like, I don't even know what, tens of millions, definitely? It it, it is tens of millions. They don't actually disclose the number, but a a lot of analysts guess at it, essentially. And the guesses range from like 40, 50, 60 million. Um, It's a large percentage of the U.S. population at this point. Um, so that that so gives crazy. Amazon lots of power there. And keep in mind, like Amazon is able to do all this stuff without needing to make money on the retail, the e-commerce. I mean, they basically break even on every part of their business except the part that's you know called Amazon Web Services, where they offer stuff you know through the cloud, cloud computing, and that that is hugely profitable. And then they basically funnel those profits back into everything else. So they've got an advantage over somebody like Netflix, who is just relying solely on their core business of providing content and uh, even Hulu to some extent, even though they're a partnership of what the, a bunch of the different media companies. Um, at any rate, Am- Amazon's just in a kind of peculiar place here. That's like, that's like what they call themselves, you know, peculiar. And it really fits because they're not like anybody else. How long until some of these big tech companies just s- kind of stop cutting out the middleman? Cause correct me if I'm wrong. Now that I think about it, there's been talk of an Apple TV, an over-the-top, replace your cable with an Apple TV system for 10 years, since before mm-hmm. Steve Jobs was gone. And it always seems to be like a year or two away, a year or two away, and it's never come. And my impression is it's because the cable companies and the networks saw what Apple did to the uh, music industry – and said, "We are. We're not getting in bed with these guys. They're gonna. They're gonna slit our throats. And by the time we realize we're dead, they'll own the whole ball game." Is how long until Apple just says, "You know what? We're we're tired of trying to untangle all these contracts. We're tired of doing all these negotiations. We're just going to start buying studios." Bang, 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 bang. Do you see any kind of consolidation like that coming down the pike? I think they'll need to do something like that to really break through because right now the way they're doing it just doesn't seem to be working. Uh, in terms of the over the top stuff, um, if you look at what like YouTube TV or Sling, I think a lot of companies are getting close to that kind of uh, you know free of the cable giant approach. You know, not having to deal with Comcast or Time Warner or whichever monolith you have in your in your city and and. I'm surprised Apple hasn't done it too, hasn't tried it too, because like YouTube TV is pretty great. It's a little it's a little spendy, um, but you know that's basically just relying on the internet to provide you something that's just like television. And 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 that's where I think the tech companies are really interesting in all this. And you know, 
Google we're not really talking about here in terms of original content, apart from, you know, some of the stuff they do on YouTube. Um, but uh, yeah, I, th I think there's, there's plenty of room there for, for somebody like Apple to come in if they do it in the right way and, and, you know, actually deliver something like that on Apple TV. Do you get any sense that they're interested in trying anything like that or, you know, I don't have quite as many direct insights like that into Apple. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure on that one. Well, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, wow, so much is changing with this culture. Because 10 years ago, when YouTube first started really rolling, and that was around the time that I was starting my video business, and I was thinking, wow, you know, YouTube is the future. YouTube is the way things are going to go. It's all going to condense around this kind of thing where producers make their own shows, upload them to YouTube, and kind of create a new ecosystem of viewership around there and in a way that's happened but in a way I, I think it was striking what you said about how much we are not talking about google right now i mean yeah. youtube has well, this thing oh what were you gonna say i was gonna say we should be talking about facebook too in all these conversations by the way that shouldn't get lost you know they launched their watch tab with original video shows um right. and i think you can't overlook Facebook. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, though, Chris. No, keep no, going. no, keep going. Because yeah, actually, that, that that was two things I want to say. Is YouTube, it's kind of like, it's surprising how much that is not developed and not created this new landscape. People, I mean, I know that there are YouTubers, uh, you know, some of which I know personally, that make a living making videos. But, you know, YouTube Red was supposed to be the situation where they were if I remember correctly, YouTube Studios was going to kind of tap its biggest creators to make shows for YouTube. And that never really kind of broke through in the consciousness. But as I say that, it could just be that I'm old. And <laughs> every, every millennial out there listening right now is screaming at their podcast player saying, hey, dummy. I'm the only thing I watch is YouTube. The only thing I watch is, and then they'll say the name of some YouTube red show that I've never heard of. Um, is that even, I mean, could, could Google just start taking some of its money and buying up studios and to make, to kind of punch YouTube or YouTube red through to the public consciousness? Cause I don't know, you know, I, I was going to say, I don't know if people really know about it, but it could just be that I don't really know about it. Yeah, you know, I think that should be on a T-shirt. It could just be that I'm old. That's going to be, <laughs> yeah. When it comes to things that I don't know about, that is going to be a massive T-shirt. I that only sucks. know about that stuff because I see, like, the, when I go to the movies, they have the, com not the coming attractions, but that, like, in the theater yeah. show before. Yeah. Do you know what I'm yeah. talking about? Yes. I forget yes. the name of it. And they'll talk about, like, shows that are on YouTube Red, and I'm like, that's a thing. That's the only way I know about it. Like nobody I know talks about anything that they watch on YouTube. Yeah. But I might be old too. Well, because that's the thing is I, I know a lot of kids and I'm thinking about get, kind of putting my toe back into those waters here in the next six months is I know a lot of kids and youngsters that watch YouTube stuff but they never seem to actually be watching the shows that YouTube Red is producing or kind of that tier. It really is just they're still watching cat videos and kids falling down and all that kind of fun stuff. <laughs> My daughter you know? loves well, Dan. I do Dan watch. TDM. I do watch. What was that? What is it? Do you know? Do you know Dan TDM? No, I don't. Oh man, see that's completely just watching how she gets involved and he's like a he's like a streamer. Uh, what a, you know a, he does uh, basically Twitch style gaming stuff okay. all you know with minecraft and stuff and just watching how she engages with that like maybe i would have watched i don't know what show would i have watched growing up mr rod i did watch mr rogers growing up i Everybody hate to tell loves mr Rod. why why that's yeah. a fantastic show sometimes yeah. i want to watch mr rogers right now yeah no absolutely no yeah sonia i totally interrupted you earlier and I expected more jokes. I have to tell you, I expected more jokes from Sonia on this show. That's why she's letting me talk. I'm so, it's because I am, I'm, I'm, I am not feeling 100%, so I apologize if I let you down. It's okay. It's all right. I, I just I always appreciated your jokes in the basement of Plumas Hall at, at Chico State. It's one of the things I looked forward well, to. That's right. Chico State's award-winning journalism program. Yes. 
I'm sorry. I guess I wasn't feeling funny enough today. I need to try harder. No, it was not. I, it was it was more aspirational. I was I was wanted to I wanted to tell you that that is one thing I appreciate about you is your sense of humor. Oh well, thank you. I obviously have a good sense of humor to talk to this guy every week. I, but no enough kidding. about Sonia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about Chris my has, humor, Todd? What, Chris what, has do, not what do changed. I think of Sonia? Chris has not what changed do I think at all. Sonia? He hasn't. He really oh, hasn't. That's actually hard to, actually, think, I, to think that I've I been this level of obnoxious that, but... for my entire life is just... You know what? I don't care. Are you still wearing the hat? <laughs> no. <laughs> and so I, would just like, I would just like to say to all of our listeners, there will be no pictures of that hat in the Twitter feed oh, of Dorking Out. There will yes, be none. It will. it will not happen. It Don't will. Worry. Sorry. Anyway. Back now to... it's going to happen. So talk to us. Actually, thank you, Todd, for bringing up Facebook. What is Facebook doing? Because I, I, that is another thing that I've heard about, but there's so much going on in the entertainment space and the television show space that I can't even keep up with everything. How deeply is Facebook jumping into this? So far, at least in terms of the original content, they're mostly dabbling. Uh, they launched this watch channel with original content provided by partners. Like there's a show with you know, like Mike Rowe and there's some baseball features on there, you know, stuff like that. Um, Facebook and YouTube for probably about the past year have really been focused on live user generated video. And I think that's to some extent distracted them from creating original content of their own. And I think this gets back to your Google question as well. I think that's one reason why we haven't seen either of these companies really dive deep into, you know, Game of Thrones. And maybe Game of Thrones is probably the unattainable example. But, you know, even Amazon level entertainment, you're not seeing that from YouTube or Facebook in terms of their original content. And I think the reason is that they're so focused on live video and that whole phenomenon. And like if we've noticed that even if we do a video live on Facebook or YouTube versus uploading it afterward, mm -hmm. because they favor it in their algorithms, you get much better engagement because they're showing it to a wider portion of your followers. And anyway, the, the live thing is a whole other separate thing. But I think that's where Facebook and YouTube have been focusing. Really? So See, I think that's so weird because I'm like, I would never go to Facebook to watch TV, basically to watch something. But then... Well, so many people yeah. go there now to get their news, and I would have never thought that. So, well, Twitter too. Don't forget, loop. don't forget Twitter in this. And I know that sounds really odd, but they had a deal last football season. And I think it's even extending to some extent into this football season. Although Amazon's gotten a big portion of the contract to do Thursday night football, and it was actually really fascinating because you know we've been talking about all these big tech companies getting into original content and for the most part they're just showing you original content on your screen and maybe it's a different screen than it was in the past and it's coming from a tech company but it's still you know a show whereas with twitter right. when when they did football like they integrated it with a twitter feed and there was it was really a slick user interface it was great and so i don't know twitter's an interesting one to watch in all this too what so you know what now that i'm thinking about this when, when i think about facebook twitter YouTube, Apple, Amazon, it almost seems like Hollywood, the big traditional studios with their traditional movie platforms and television platforms are there just because Silicon Valley has not woken up one day and said, you know what, we're going to rip this up too. We're going to go after this. I mean, it seems like they're just waiting for the other shoe to drop and when somebody in Seattle or Silicon Valley makes a decision, things are going to move really quick, and you know the changes that we've seen so far are going to look like nothing. Do you mean in terms of the format, like the way things are shown, or just in terms of like the amount of money they're spending and the, the volume the, of content? Yeah, yeah, the amount of money that they're spending or the volume of content. Because I remember back, I mean, back in the '80s when when Sony bought Columbia Pictures and TriStar and all that, there was, you know, Hollywood goes through these periods where there's kind of an inundation of money. And in the past, what it's been is the studios bring in the money. They, you know, they get investments from overseas, but they still pretty much run the way that they've always run. 
And I have a feeling with the value that these companies are now seeing and the <laughs> price differential between a Facebook and a Paramount Pictures, it's just a matter of time before, you know, it could be, you know, one or two years and every single studio could be bought up and turned into essentially a massive production house to fill these programming channels. Um, well, absolutely. And, but, but here's the problem. And this actually gets to your question earlier, like, where does this all go? I feel like there's too much content right now. I, oh I can't God, keep up with is. it. I can't watch it all. This is something we talk about on the show every week. I'm like, there's too much stuff to watch. We can't all watch it all. So you know what that suggests, like on the business side, is that it's a bubble. Yeah. That eventually, they're, you know, they're making bets. People are sort of funding all this stuff on a hope that they'll build a big business or get a hit show. Right. And over time, not everybody can do that because not all of us can watch every damn thing that comes out. Yeah. Well, you know, that's true. I, I But I do think that there's a lot of people um, that, that the way people – libraries are becoming more valuable than actual new shows. So – and I think Netflix has kind of seen this where – and I've noticed – I noticed this myself when I – when Twin Peaks came on Showtime, I had not had Showtime for several years. So when I signed up, I was going to just watch Twin Peaks and then I was going to be out. And then I realized, wow, they've got billions. They've got all of these shows I've heard so much about <laughs> that it's like, oh, now what I'll do is I'll just burn through all these shows. And Showtime, instead of getting my money for two or three months, will get my money for a year, year and a half. And then I'll say, all right, I've seen it all. And then I'll jump, theoretically jump over to facebook or something or youtube red or something and there will just be a you just reminded me i need to uh you just reminded that. me i need to ca i need to cancel my show time <laughs> <That's right. laughs> i also just signed up for twin peaks you know mm. i'm wondering if there's a lot more and actually the, the other thing i was thinking is i'm i'm seeing some of the uh ratings come in for the the orville seth mcfarland's star trek type show um and they're talking about how it's the biggest drama premiere they've had since Empire several years ago, which was supposedly a huge hit. But the size of the audience for these shows now is so minuscule. I, I, I'm essentially talking this out as I think that there's a lot of – these companies can get by a, kind of on a lot less money than they project or that they fronted. In years past, they've oh you know if a if a, if a show gets ten million views, that's not that's not big enough for us, so we're going to cancel it. But I think correct me if I'm wrong. The season finale of Game of Thrones was like sixteen million views, sixteen million viewers. I mean, so these studios are getting by on a f fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the audience that they used to be able to get by on. Um, and I'm, I really am just wondering if the entertainment appetite in the market, and maybe I'm just being silly here, and may, you, you could be right about the bubble top. top well, you're probably being silly. Is if it's just there's just more appetite. I don't know. I'm wondering now if, if the entertainment appetite that's been on going in America has been two or three times what we've always kind of assumed it was. If, if, if it can sustain two or three, you know, one or two or three or four more Hollywood Hollywoods than it has in the past. I don't know. Right. No, I get what you're saying. I, I, I don't, I personally don't think so. Maybe that's, maybe I'm old, but I, I think, uh, <laughs> that's, that should be the real title of this segment. Maybe I'm old. Maybe, maybe I'm just old. I think that was, that was it. <laughs> um, but there is so much competing for our attention that is not a produced TV show or movie that was not competing for our attention in the past. You know, I'll do it like every once every week or so, I'll just leave my phone down on my desk in the, in my office at home, my downstairs office. And like, like I, I don't know what to do. And there's, you know, it, it's just such a different world. I am, I don't think we can keep up with this level of expansion of the media business, like media meaning 
television and, and entertainment and to streaming. I, I just think that there's there's got to be a point where the there's not enough audience to sustain all of the development that's happening. So, all right, I, I guess this is a great place to bring the segment in for a landing. What's going to happen then? Tell us, just tell us the future, and uh, that's all we ask. I, I, you know the future, yeah. right, Todd? Yeah, exactly. you know the future. Exactly. Yes. Um, I can guess at it. I, I can certainly guess at it. Um, if if I were to guess, I think that it's going to be Netflix because they have the brand recognition. As long as they can continue to figure out the next hit shows, I think HBO is big. I. I I'm not so sure about Hulu, even with the wins tonight. But ultimately, I think it's very, very hard to count out Amazon here in terms of where they're headed. Uh, it, it's just it's th- because they don't get into this point. They can afford to just keep pouring money into this if they want to and not have to worry about it because the rest of their business basically covers for them. Um I, I would like to see some kind of new form of entertainment that brings in all the social stuff for real. I right. think that's that's my big thing. Like you're sitting there on your couch with your smartphone in your hand, looking to your left and then looking up at your TV or your tablet or whatever you got. I think for most people, I think it's the phone. That just doesn't seem like the end. You know, it feels like there's got to be something that brings all those together. And that's why the Twitter thing I was talking about earlier was so interesting where they played the feed right next to the football game. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to see like a hollow deck kind of experience. You know, we're talking about virtual reality and the headsets. Right. I'd love to see something that's like you walk into a room and there around you, the drama unfolds. Right. Uh, that would be pretty cool. Those yeah. are my three things. Now, I know that I said I was bringing this in for a landing, but that sparked another thing I meant to ask about. Microsoft's HoloLens almost seemed to be something like that. Correct me if I'm yeah. wrong, where it would kind of, you would look around the room that you're in, but it wouldn't be the room that you were in. It would be something completely different. And that was supposedly generating a lot of heat a couple of years ago. And now that we're talking about it, I'm realizing, oh, yeah, that never came or that never came in any significant form. For, for HoloLens itself? Yeah. Or- yeah, Microsoft is really focused on business stuff. And what happened? They had there's they had a new CEO come in, Satya Nadella, right. and uh, uh, who's speaking at our GeekWire Summit for any of your listeners in the Seattle area. GeekWire.com/slash/summit, October 10th and 11th. That's how you sell it. That's how you sell it. You too, just so you know. Oh yeah, well we definitely <laughs> we do need to know because we, don't, we so, don't know how to sell. But, Scott. But we don't know how to do it. We That's really right. don't. To to your point though, I mean they they were. I think they had had some initial things that were very entertainment-y with HoloLens, uh, but then they uh, they focused much more on Microsoft's core, which is you know enterprise software and that sort of stuff. So they've got a lot of commercial applications. But more importantly, random Orion trivia, if I can throw this in here, Mary Mary McMahon. I remember now, her. Remember her? Do you remember what her yes. what she did there? She what was, did she do? She was the entertainment editor, I think, or features editor. She was my editor for something a while back. Anyway, She's, yeah. Yeah, she was also the sex columnist, if I remember That's correctly. That's right. That's right. And, and then she defected, if I remember correctly, and worked for the synthesis, which was just I, if if I'm, I'm I might be remembering this incorrectly. Do you remember this? Uh, I do remember something. this. I actually wrote for both as well. Yes, I remember at one was, point, and then made a choice and decided to stay with the Orion. I was not cool rate. enough to write for the synthesis, so I I, I, I didn't do, have any of these problems. Do you know what Mary's doing now? No, no, she but the, you're going to make me she, get she, jealous. I can tell. She is the chief of staff at the, on the Hololens team. Oh my. God. Wow. Isn't that crazy? This is awesome. You know, you know what would really drive that home is why don't you call her up and tell her to send us a couple of hollow lenses? Uh, okay, I'll we'll send see us send us some stuff or your sex columns are coming out. <laughs> oh my god. That's right. See, Sonia, that is what I expected. <laughs> Blackmail. Uh, that's what you expected. That's right. 
<laughs> now the real so it takes bringing Todd onto the show to show our audience just well, see, what Sony now, has been like. Now you guys are talking about stuff I can get in all this other stuff, streaming, whatever, blah, whatever. Now we're talking about sex columns. Yay! What, what do you know about sex columns? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I think that just competed with maybe I'm just too old for episode <laughs> title. <laughs> so. Todd Bishop, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, um, it's been fun. <laughs> where can people find you? Geekwire.com. And we're a, we're a site. We're based in Seattle. We like to say that uh, we're an, a national technology news site that sort of looks at the world through a lens from the Pacific Northwest up here, just to differentiate ourselves from the sea of crappy Silicon Valley tech news sites. Yeah. Uh, right. And uh, yeah, so Geek, Silicon Geekwire. Valley. Geekwire.com. No, there's, hey, lots of great stuff happened in Silicon Valley. There's just so many tech sites down there. You know, it, we're, our, we have a, a unique view from our perch up here, we like to say. Yeah. So, cool. all right. Excellent. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, Todd? Absolutely. It was fun dorking out. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Don't, no good, like we like to say, no good deed goes unpunished. Expect tw tweets, expect Facebook messages begging you to come back on the show very soon. Nice. So. Anytime. I'm happy to do it. And that brings us to what we're dorking out about that this week. I almost said that week. This week. It's the Emmy Awards recap. The Emmys just finished a few hours ago and We've got a lot of things we want to say about them. Uh, in case you didn't watch, The Handmaid's Tale, that's on Hulu, won six Emmys, including Best Drama Series and Best Actress for Elizabeth Moss. Big Little Lies on HBO won five, including Best Actress for Nicole Kidman and Best Limited Series. And Veep won Best Comedy Series. Uh, SNL won a slew of awards, including one for Alec Baldwin and Kate McKinnon. Uh, Smith, what did you think about the show? Were you happy with the show? Were um, you bored by the show? Because I'm usually pretty bored by the show. I was happy. I became bored. And I have to say, I really miss Stephen Colbert. He seems to be... Ever since he went to CBS, he's he has hit his stride. He's top of the late night ratings, but his sharpness and his smartness just seemed to be missing. And it was like he was on tonight, and there were moments that were kind of funny, but there's a lot of moments where he just kind of landed with a thud, and it's kind of breaking my heart. He he was my favorite comedian for a couple of years there. And right. it's like he's he, he's still working, he's still on TV every night, but I never get to see the Steven I like, and it's just right. kind of sad. Well, hosting the Emmys is kind of a thankless job. Like, yeah. it's so, you have to be so vanilla. Yeah. Like, you really are just, it's just kind of a boring gig. I mean, they do the best they can. They do like a song and dance at the beginning now that's sometimes entertaining. Right. But I don't know. It's I've said I say this every year. I'm like, this is the one night of the year that we're supposed to be honoring like the best in television. And it's the most boring night of TV ever. It... But, like with the forced like. Dialogue that they do with the. You know, where they come out and they're like, I love your dress. No, I love your dress. You know, yeah, whatever. Well, like, that's that's what happens whenever you have actors talk to each other. It turns into a, <laughs> oh, you're the best. You're the best. Oh, it's such an honor. So, work. And they're before, so much fun to work with. Oh, my God. Shut up. I never watch actors. Before I started bagging on everything about the show, I wanted to mention a few things that I liked that happened. I like seeing uh, Riz Ahmed win for the night of. I think that series was really awesome and i think it really kind of got overshadowed by like big little lies and you know handmaid's tale and things like that and i thought he was really good and i was really excited to see him win i was excited to see donald glover win yeah uh you know especially for directing i thought that was really really cool um 
I love seeing Laura Dern win for Best Supporting Actress in a Limited Series for Big Little Lies because I think Laura Dern is awesome and she should be in everything. Right. And I also, uh, I think Elizabeth Moss is a really amazing actress. You know, of course, she was nominated like every year for Peggy Olsen and never won. And she finally won tonight. But she also does um, the show Top of the Lake. Which, and she's amazing in that. Are you watching that by by the way? I am. Okay. I am. I'm I'm almost finished actually. Oh, well, I got to that's another that's another show I got to watch. But she she won for The Handmaid's Tale and I felt like that was very uh justified. Yeah. That that made me happy. It's yeah, I mean I liked it. That, that is one thing that's interesting is that the the regional Emmys, the one that that I've gone to a couple times, and the national Emmys, I've never, I've Here never we go. Everybody yeah, exactly. drink. <laughs> they all talk about how long it is, and what's funny is when I when I set up my TiVo because TiVo is still the best uh, DVR. <laughs> TiVo. When I set up my TiVo to record the Emmys, it's three hours, a three hour block. It's three hours, and I think this one went three hours and five minutes or something. Yeah. But it's kind of like, look, you guys blocked that out for three hours. Don't get into, like, hour, you know, two and go, God, this is taking forever. I think I, I was a little irritated because it's kind of like they're talking about how long it is, but it's like, you guys know you're not running over. You're not going too fast. You're not, right. You're, you're, not going too, you're not going too long. This is the way it is. Don't, you know, when... Some of the, some of the ones that I've been to, they're like four and a half hours. That's a huge, you know. This That's was insane. moving along. exactly. It is insane. But what's interesting is for the national Emmys, it's they already had the kind of ones that we talked about last week. Plus these, they're they're just too many Emmy categories. There's right. too many, and it, it 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 is kind of a joke. In that there's so many categories and every little thing you can win something for that there's there's like even even at the regional level it's there's like seventy categories and at the national level it looks like there's a hundred and fifty I saw you know in some of the crowd shots they were showing they you know they have like a booklet that they give right. out everybody and the booklet for the national Emmys tonight <laughs> it's like a phone book. Of who's nominated and what category they're nominated in and just whatever. And it's just like, holy smokes, that thing really is like a phone book. So it's just. So what can they do much. to speed it up? Like, can they move some more awards to like the Creative Arts Emmys? Well, they could. Yes, they could. But that's the thing is there, there are ones in the Creative Arts Emmys. Where I can't believe they're not. I can't believe they're on not this on show. this. And and that's yeah. the thing is the amount, you know, it, it, that's what I meant to say before I got rambling, is Stephen Colbert <laughs> kept making these comments like, oh, my God, it's taking so long. It's, no, it's not taking so long. You're putting out a ridiculous amount of Emmys in just three hours. You are flying through these. It's. I thought it, it, it you know did kind of move could, along. Hmm? They could still make this tighter, though, if, like, they don't need to do a segment where they're like, let's interview RuPaul as an Emmy. Let's do a Westworld spoof. Like, you they, know what? That I'll, stuff's stupid. You could just cut it out. I would I would love more spoofs. I thought I thought the Westworld eh. spoof was really funny. And that is a big strength of this. Is because that's the thing, is let's like if we take out all those things, all you're gonna have are people at podiums reading names and then getting awards and thanking people it's just gonna be listing names thank you listing names thank you as a show to watch it will be even more boring even more irritating i guess um, that's true than what we would have now you know what you know what they could do i i think i'm gonna go in the other direction is it should be a limited series. Is is they should. <laughs> they should do 10 episodes. They should do like a two. Oh, no. Here's what they do. Here's what they do. <laughs> you have, let's see, you got Fox, CBS, ABC, and NBC. So you got four big, big, big networks that everybody has. You should have four nights. 
<laughs> That's a terrible idea. One night, no, you, you, like the month of September, every Saturday night, there's a different thing. And instead of having uh, them just hear the list of nominations and here's the award, they should do it kind of like the creative arts, where we've already given out all the awards. Now we're going to talk to the people about what they did. We're going to highlight their show almost kind of like, you know, those packages that they do for athletes in the Olympics. Right. It would be like that, but it would be for here's 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 what they're getting nominated for. Here's the show. Here's what the show is about. Here's what their character is. Here's them talking about doing No, the everybody would hate that. No, cuz here's what it would be. No, it, they would. No, listen. Hold on. What it would be is essentially a guide for good stuff to watch on television. It would be essentially Four nights of not trailers exactly. They don't need that. They have us, Smith. No, they don't. We, they, we can't do it all, Sonia. We're being crushed under the weight of all this stuff that we're not even watching. We're, we, that's what they should do. Because having people stand at podiums, I believe I speak with some authority on this, having people stand at podiums talking about stuff and how thankful they are for blah, blah, blah. No one wants to watch it. Listen to me. Nobody wants to watch that. You didn't want to well, watch that tonight. Nobody wants to see that. We want to see. I the really don't. Yeah. We, we like the shows, but we don't like the awards. So just ju- junk the awards. Say this 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 person won for this thing, and uh, and really get into it. That's what I would say. I did write down some things that I thought were uh, maybe not as happy. Okay. to be watching the show other than the fact that it's boring. Um, look, I love Julia Louise Dreyfus just as much as everyone else. It's so <laughs> boring watching her win every year. Apparently, well, actually, how many years has she won for this? She's won every year. How ma- Let's look it up. She's won like, this is like her fifth time in a row or something. And it's like season right? six, right? I don't know. Yeah. It's something. I think it's her sixth time in a row. I'm not sure. Yeah, you know... Let's see. She won. Yeah. Yeah. She's been winning since. Oh, my gosh. She's been winning (laughs) since 2012. (laughs) 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Like, come on. That's pretty boring. It is. But, you know. It's and it's not because I don't think she's awesome. I do think she's awesome. But come on. Well, you That's know what's so boring. Here's what's funny is this has happened before. John Larroquette back in the eighties went through a yes. streak like this. And well, eventually I don't think he won this many times. No, here's the thing. If I remember correctly, after he won four in a row, he took his name out of consideration. Yeah. She Here, needs to take her name out. Exactly. The reason she's winning is because she keeps putting her name in and this right. whole kind of like, oh, yeah, I, I'm being awarded too much. I know from experience the way you don't get <laughs> rewarded is don't go out for – don't put your name in for, for consideration. Don't right. don't fill out the slips, the, you know, the forms. Don't put all your information down. Don't send it in. Don't. <laughs> Don't right. register. There's a lot of not when let me tell you, not winning an well, Emmy is one of she's the easiest things you can do. She's gonna win it again next year when they finish their final season. So it's like now she will have won how many it'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. She'll have won like eight of them. So for, here's, just just for Veep. So let me ask you this then. Doesn't that mean I mean one of the reasons that I talk about the Emmys a lot is because there it's a, giving awards for artistic achievements like this is a pretty ridiculous pastime. Um, that's one of the reasons, you know, you and I have talked about rather than having awards for this kind of stuff, it's everybody that gets nominated should get, should be awarded because they have achieved something of distinction when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, just getting nominated is as hard as winning. And if you can do it, you should get the award. But she, if she wins eight awards for this category, that is kind of like saying, according to the Emmys and what they value and the, what the voters value, she is given the greatest comedic female performance in the history of television. Right. No well, one else, she, no one else has, has done this. Maybe she has. 
Uh, I kind of tend to think that Carol Burnett maybe had a run. I kind of tend to think <laughs> uh, uh, Lucio Ball might have something to say about that. I, I And maybe Veep is, you know, I actually, now that I'm thinking about this, I am saying this is somebody who's watched maybe three episodes of the show. And it's right. funny. I really like it. It's not the, it's not one of the, I don't think it's one of the, greatest comedies of all time but maybe maybe i'm missing something it just bums me out because a lot of shows have kind of come and gone and like amy poehler never won for parks and rec that's right and i think that's really sad yeah yeah you know stuff like that that's all yeah um what did you think of oh what were you gonna say go ahead no go ahead what what did you think of I understand Billy Crystal used to do this when he hosted the Oscars. I think he did it well, which is he would sprinkle in enough topical stuff to kind of hit the high notes or talk about things that are going on. But I thought the level of vitriol on this show was obnoxious, not because I don't agree politically with kind of a lot of the stuff that was said, but it's kind of like... It, this is an award show. You guys are literally giving gold statues to each other. Right. Getting up on your high horse about politics is just really obnoxious. And I get it. You feel passionately and, you know, we, we all feel passionately. We all wonder what's going on. But can you imagine in any other arena of life, like uh, like at your your, your your holiday Christmas party. So you get all your coworkers around and they start handing out bonuses and everybody get, that gets a bonus gets up on the desk and say, thank you for the bonus. I really like working here, but let me tell you about what's going on with the president. And then right. they just start going off. It's like, what does this have to do with the reason we're all here? Or if you went to like, you know, like a kid's little league game and well, every well, parent got up in the stands. Because to... he... He is a, you know, reality show game show host, basically. True. So, I, so I, I do it, get it's that. kind of appropriate. But, you know, it is, it's so funny because he, uh, Stephen Colbert had the song at the beginning about, like, how TV's like an escape. Right. And then proceeded to make it so that we couldn't escape for three hours. <laughs> That's it. That's exactly it. It's kind Including of like bringing out Sean Spicer, which made me so angry. Which is like, yeah, made I, me so angry when that happened. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I, I think part of it is it wasn't funny enough for the awkwardness in the room. Like right. it was. It's kind of like, oh, okay, Sean Spicer's going to come out here and he's going to pretend to talk about numbers. I I get it because he did that thing that one time. I get it. Remember when he lied for the remember, president? Yeah, the remember time? when he did That's that so thing? Funny. Yeah, now it's he's just so funny. That you know what it is? That's it. That's the that's the kind of blunt, dull, non-cutting humor that Stephen Colbert was not known for. That, that he, right. he was much that's that's thank you for that's the kind of thing it's just kind of this dud of a joke that just sits out there that i'm yeah i don't know it it just well, it it does feel very weird to have this many uh, the thing actually let me say back the thing that i thought was really funny is when he started talking about how if they had given Trump an Emmy way back when, maybe right. we wouldn't be going yeah. through all this. Like, that was funny. It was on topic. It connected right. to what they were doing so perfectly. It was really funny. And then it's like in an ideal world or my ideal Emmys, that's where they would have left it. It's like we made right. our point. We had our joke. We took our shot. Here we go. You know, and then when Alec Baldwin got up for playing and got the award for playing Trump, and he made his little thing like, here's your Emmy, Mr. President. That's funny. That connects. Right. That you know, But most of the other discussions or uh, name drops but, or comments just seemed like, oh, my God, can we just give it The Spicer thing made me so frustrated because I felt like it was like giving him like a redemption moment that he doesn't deserve. 
or something like come on you guys know. like everything like he's a good sport maybe and i was like he i just don't feel like he deserves it maybe i don't know that's I that's think... how it felt to me no i hear what like, you're saying like I... a rehab tour basically. i agree like let's you know and i was like he doesn't deserve it he's an awful liar and he's I... disgusting i hear you i think part part of what i'm <laughs> rebelling against a little bit is the idea that you can get redeemed because you do some funny thing on an award show is there's a there's a there's a level and i think this is the most ironic or i've ever been on this show there's a level of self-congratulatory backslapping <laughs> that happens with this that i find so obnoxious that it's just like no, nothing's really changed because yeah. he came out and he said a joke on your show. It's it's well, like you know, Colbert recently had uh, the Mooch on, too. Yeah, you know, and I was like, no, I'm not going to watch that. And no, he's disgusting. He's still disgusting. Like, I'm sorry, I don't like that these guys get like a PR tour or whatever after they've been fired. Right. Basically, like it offends well, me. Yeah, I hear I, I hear you. I, you know, I think they're... Like, oh, I'm going to go on Colbert and be all funny and charming. And it's like, <laughs> he worked for Trump and he told all these lies. It's so funny. Like, yeah. it just bothers me. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. No, I and hear so, you. so, therefore, the song at the beginning was a little, you know, yeah. well, let's all watch TV to forget. But we're going to remind you every five seconds. Yeah, I, I, I do agree. I think there's a... You know, it's funny. It's. I don't so, want to end the show on a bummer. No, no but I was I was going to say. Frustrated we, me. We, we, yeah, we've kind of been talking around this, but it, it is a very strange experience. When we look at the shows, think, think about this. And I, I'm actually kind of serious when I say they should go back and make like four nights highlighting each of the winners. And the reason I say this is look at the Outstanding Comedy Series. Atlanta, Blackish, Master of None, Modern Family, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Silicon Valley, One un un Unbreakable, not like <laughs> the <Kimmy> other. <laughs> <laughs> Veep. If you look at that list, the amount of entertainment you could create just by highlighting the strengths of all those shows and doing like a five-minute little package of what Atlanta is about, what the characters are like, who's acting in it, what... That would be, and then this is why Atlanta deserves to be nominated. Would be really fantastic. I mean, think about think about the the level of enjoyment you would get from a five minute sizzle reel and a behind the scenes thing about Stranger Things or Westworld or The Crown or, or Better Call Saul. Think about the amount of entertainment and enjoyment you would get for just a kind of a little preview taste of any of these well, shows. Well, and, what's and funny then, is the think, Emmys well, well, used got. to... Yeah. The Emmys used to kind of do that, like, because they didn't show, like, all these awards. They showed kind of, like, the major ones, if I remember this correctly. Yeah. And they used to show, like, clips from the show. Like, yeah. that's why there's the joke about, like, you know, there's your Emmy clip or there's your Oscar clip. Right. Because they used to actually show clips from the shows that they're talking about. So you could watch it and you're like, oh, I never actually watched that show. And you get to see a clip and you're like, that's pretty good. That looks good. I exactly. might watch that. Thank but they you. don't do that anymore. They just show it kind of while they're saying their name. Like, here's Reese Witherspoon. And then they show, like you know, a clip, but they don't really show you a clip. Yeah, you know? they, they, they show you three seconds of her moving, but you don't hear what she says. And yes. that, that's a shot of her in the show. But that's, you know what, Sonia, thank you for saying that. That's exactly what, what I was meaning to say earlier, is you communicate what the greatness or what is special about that show and get people interested in the show. That is what the Emmys used to be, which is, highlighting what is worthwhile in television which i which now that we're thinking talking about this it seems insane that the emmys would be kind of falling down on this job in this era where more good stuff is being made at a faster rate you know it's what we talked about this with todd bishop is there's so yeah. much out there that it's impossible to get through any of it 
Like, think about and it like if this. If you look at all these things yeah. that are nominated, this is awesome stuff. It is. You know, I was like, Handmaid's Tale is awesome. Right. You know, uh, Veep is awesome. Right. You know, Big Little Lies is awesome. I mean, everything under limited series yeah. was great. You know, like, there's just so much awesome stuff. There's so much good TV. I, how you make that the most boring night of television of the year, I just don't know. <laughs> yeah. Which is, no, think about this. Think about, like, outstanding supporting actress, actress in a comedy series. Imagine a 15-minute segment where one, two, three, four, five, six, where three minutes of the best stuff of Kate McKinnon, Vanessa Bear, Leslie Jones, Anna Chumsky for Veep, Judith Light for Transparent, Catherine Hahn for Transparent. If you had three minutes of what they did as an actress, their funniest couple moments, you would be that would be a fantastic fifteen minutes of television. If they highlighted it like that. Right. But, it, or you know, it's just, ah, yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, you know, we've already talked about how we should remake the Oscars. Now this is how we should remake the Emmys. <laughs> Four nights where each night we highlight, a, you know, like uh, night one is comedy. All the shows, all the performances, the guest performances, that comedy on this night, dramas on this night, limited shows on this night. And then, I don't know. I guess you only need three nights. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So that's what they should do. Uh, oh, well, we solved it. We solved You're it. You're welcome, Emmys. You're welcome. So, uh, is there anything else that you would like to say after this mammoth and fantastic <sighs> episode of Dorking Out? I think I've said enough. I'll just say goodbye. Goodbye! <laughs> Dorking Out Show is on Twitter at Dorking Out Show, where you can find Chris at Jet Jurgens and Sonia at The Sonia Show. You can read about Sonia's random adventures at thesoniashow.com and track the slow and creeping progress of Chris's novel and his other hijinks at jetjurgens.com. You can find out more about The Dorking Out Show at dorkingoutshow.com. While you're over there, you can support us by giving us a review on iTunes. We have a handy-dandy iTunes link to whisk you right back to 2007 where you can leave your review and five-star rating in iTunes. We'd do it for your podcast. Want to dork out even more? Well, you can sign up for our newsletter where you'll get all the headlines we use as fuel for the show. That's it for this week. Thanks for listening.